lines to make the discussion easier. Please. Please. Yes, of course. Brother in the Wait. back, sister in the back, Wait. come forward. Yeah. Yeah. So it will be a discussion more than uh,
cycling days um, um, for women, especially in Sudan, it's a very difficult issue for women because women, uh, they say that we don't so have drugs. Can I ask you a question? Please. What can cycling do to the people in conflict of South Sudan or to the people in conflict in Kashmir? Okay, uh, we have one. We are the Indian Kashmir, not the Pakistani Kashmir. Okay. That's it. Uh, Relate so, to the current situation. Okay. So we have also think. Anybody who takes notes, there is his hand or his hand. Can you take this notes better? <coughs> it's not true. You want to take I love all of you. <laughs> you do one. I'll yes. do it. And you do one. You sir. Okay? And uh, 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 Bobby. Bobby, I, Bobby. Uh, three. I want three 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 notes. Okay, my sister. Okay. Kashmir and South Sudan. And South Sudan. First, I'll talk about South Sudan. Which is sports, the sports and sports and, conflict. Yes, sports and conflict. Um, so, we have a lot of sports and conflict and reconciliation. So, uh, I mean, why are these um, tribal conflicts happening? There are so many reasons behind it. And uh, because it's more due to their uh, beliefs. It's their beliefs and uh, they just uh, give it the name of the religion. But it's actually the beliefs and taboos which they believe in. So how can we use sports as the aid of reconciliation? Uh, for example, let's say that uh, there are two tribes. Uh, so I want you to, he's going to take some points from you as well. Sports and conflict. Okay. Yeah. Give us bullet points. So let's say that uh, there, uh, there are two tribes. Okay. And both of them are having conflicts. And, uh, I'm just, I just say, I'm talking about Sudan, South Sudan. So one is Danube and one is from the North Sudan. They are in the border. Both of them are fighting for the land. That this land belongs to South and this land belongs to the North. Maybe it's rich in petroleum, maybe it's rich in agriculture, or maybe it's rich in gold. It can be anything. So they are fighting for the land. So how, what role can sports play? First of all, sports role is uh, reconciling them together. We will have friendly days, I think, every week. So that we gather different people from uh, diversity of culture together. It can be from both the tribes and even other. We introduce the sheikhs and uh, you know the powerful stakeholders and policy makers people as well, so that uh, they eat and uh, we go together. So, here so now we talk about the stakeholders and the leaders of the community. Yes. Chefs, sultan, tribal leaders, community leaders. Okay, that's what we call youth, youth. women. Okay. okay, thank you. This is the first, the first point of discussing in sports in conflict. Do you agree that sports have a role in conflict, bring peace during the conflict? It has a big role. It has a big role. Okay, I'm just asking. Um, there's a, there's a you disagree. Why do you disagree? Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Kwaha uh, Ali, I'm a student here in Sudan uh, from South Africa. The reason I disagree because when you play sports, for example, soccer, one guy supports Manchester, one guy supports Liverpool. When one, one is fighting to win, so the guy that loses starts hitting the other guy. I've seen cases where people end up fighting because why? He lost the match. So that's why I disagree. Okay, thank you. It might carry the conflict. But carry on. No, but Anybody else disagree? Anybody else disagree? Anybody else agree? Okay, I'll give another minute. Okay. So, uh, well, uh, well, taking this point, what I'll do is that I will make, if, if there are two matches, if I combine them, I will not make one tribe as one match and the second tribe as second match. I will mix them together. I will mix them together so it's composed of both, let's say they are Christians and Muslims, it's composed of both Christians and Muslims in this team and both in that team. So that's why there would be cheers for both of them and uh, that's how they will come together you know because if they are in one team they will get to know each other more and they will be closer to each other more and that's how they can come closer and uh, uh, you know then it, it can go for the even taking the role for women because uh, as we say that women have cultural barriers as well in, in the conflict zones and uh, they are being attacked uh, you know uh, let's say that um, 
these people will rape other women or other tribal women or they will just burn the homes and things like that if, if they are just living alone and things like that, if they are insecure. So if they are in sports together, they will automatically take care of their fellow person to get, because they become like a family. So you, you, what you are telling us now, you are using sports as a first step to start to interact, With the actually to know one another, not for the winning, like you said, Manchester United and Liverpool or AC Milan and BC Milan or CC Milan. Have you heard of them? I met them. ABC, SEC, BBC, anything. <laughs> uh, new, 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 new sports club. New sports club. So it's the first step of knowing one another. Thank you. Thank you okay. so much. Any other examples? She mentioned uh, the sports. Oh, well, thank you. Sports and conflict. Any other things for you? Because we talk about how to sit down together and to conduct a dialogue between different parts. Okay. I can try. Yes, for that. I got Armenia and Azerbaijan. Explain to them what, what is the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, okay. You are, I am an Armenian and you are Azeri. Okay, no problem. Okay, carry on. So, uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm Kinar from Armenia. So many of you haven't heard about Armenia. It's a little country located in Caucasus, near Turkey, Iran, Azerbaijan and Georgia. So just to imagine where it is. Uh, since uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, we have a conflict with Azerbaijan uh, about a small land called Nagorno-Karabakh. In 1994, there was a ceasefire, but till now, every day, almost every day, ceasefire is like broken. And a year ago, there was a four-day war where more than 150 Armenian uh, soldiers from our side were killed, and I can't say any statistics from other side. And I have uh, been, um, I studied the university, which was 25 kilometers far from the border, Ar Armenian Azerbaijani border, and I could feel how society uh, is trying to overcome the conflict and trying to how? find. How? Uh, they are, how? They are like, um, they don't want to see this uh, as a, Azerbaijanis as an enemy. They want peace. The only thing they want is a peace. But how to reach peace? They don't know the ways how to how to uh, establish peace in the region. Let me ask some things. You might be a little bit embarrassed to say because the Armenian are uh, uh, Christian and the Azeri. Uh, yeah, we have different uh, religion, yeah. and I have uh, participated in many peace building projects. But the most significant one I would like to mention it was in Budapest, Hungary, uh, Youth Peace Camp. Uh, it was a special project by the uh, Council of Europe for conflict-affected countries and there were participants from Armenia and Azerbaijan and we had modern community sessions for uh, six days. And what we understood, we were getting together around the table and discussing the issues in both countries and what we understood uh, that we have the same problems in both countries. We have this political manipulation, we have crisis, we have hatred in both countries. And the problem was to find the ways to overcome these problems because since uh, 1994, it's already like 25 years and the whole generation grew in both countries hating each other. And they don't have a way to come together, to speak together, to rise up a question. She mentioned sports. Do you have any other idea, brilliant idea that you want uh, to give them? I'm about, because um, Armenians in Azerbaijan, Armenians can go to Azerbaijan and Azeris can come to Armenia. I think that the best way in this case is to choose a third country where the representative of both countries, the youth, can come together, can find, can talk, just talk, to raise up questions and try to find solutions. And then when they both are going back to their countries, they can change something and they can Another start question, themselves. is the politician uh, the problem or the religious leaders are the problem? Uh, I don't think that the religious leaders are and the problem. Yeah, politicians are the problem, and yeah, it is exactly like you understand that this is a conflict between, not between the nations, but between the countries and between the third countries as well. But uh, if you start to change something from yourself, do you from agree your country, with her analysis? You can have a result. Or do you disagree with her analysis? You agree? Anybody disagree? Can I add something? Yeah, you will do. I'll let you okay. after the agree or disagree. Anybody disagree before she carry on? Okay. Okay, uh, Budapest was a city where Armenian soldier was killed by Azeri, by an ex. And it was considered to be like 
really dangerous country where we are going. And when I was accepted for the program and I was going to stay with Azerbaijani people, it was super difficult for me to tell about this my parents. Because you know these stereotypes, you know this way of thinking, and this is Budapest, you never know what's going to happen to you. And then it was very difficult for me, but I have decided not to tell that I'm going to meet Azerbaijani people and I'm going to stay with my relatives. And, um, and then uh, my mother was there, like not that much angry, but they were very offended that I haven't told them anything. After one day, two, three, um, I started to talk with my parents, and then I understood that they were really interested in everything I have told them. They were interested in the experience I had. And they were, but they wanted to know more about it and how I could took this risk and how I was safe in Budapest and no other killed me like the case happening a couple of years ago. It was, it was really amazing. It's, it's my example, but I, I think that uh, dialogue, um, that just simple talk, simple discussion, simple communication with people can change something. So in an analysis, she said the politicians are the problem. That's what she said. She said connection, communication, and dialogue is like the sports. You start, I think I remember this, after the Second World War, uh, it was the first uh, American, Russia, not Russian, uh, Chinese team playing table tennis. You remember this? So they said Big Monk uh, Championship, then it's China. And for the first time, the American traveled to China to play sport. Yeah. And she said dialogue. Dialogue. Dialogue, is that right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Azari. <laughs> You're okay. welcome. Anybody else for another conflict? So we talked about sports and this role. We talked about dialogue in, in, in an open meeting, an open forum outside the conflict zones. Anything else? You are the brains of tomorrow. And the eyes and ears of today and the vision, you come with one to me. As Yemeni like yourself, I can ask you to come. I'm Kenyan and she's Yemeni. They have got the North-South conflict in Yemen. Not talking about that. Ah, I'll talk about it. So, yeah, I'm Khadija Dohri. Allah, no, no, no. All the women are coming up and the men are relaxing. Subhanallah. Ah, I'll pick up a new people. I'm reaching you. Take it off. Okay, thank you. It's another conflict, huh? Yeah, it's not really, not sorry about gender. Gender conflict. Yeah. So, um, I'm not going to talk about interfaith because most of us are going to focus on that. I, am, I want to talk about intercultural conflict that comes with uh, the coming in of refugees in uh, countries right now. I live in Turkey and I was able to experience the first wave of uh, Syrian refugees coming into Turkey. And for every community, just like in the West, even Turkey, the fact that it's a Muslim country, the idea is that it has accepted millions of refugees coming in from Syria. On a local scale, when you interact with the Turkish community, you do feel like people are kind of scared because it's a different culture coming in. It's a different language of uh, these people. And then there's the promise of the Syrian refugees being given the identity or the citizenship as Turks. And for Turkish people, from where they come from, uh, the identity is so important. So giving the citizenship to, to somebody who is uh, non-Turkish is a big deal to them. So with this kind of uh, challenges that we're facing today, especially with the refugees trying to cross into Europe, going through Turkey, I am looking at the conflict in the terms of how can we integrate the refugees in the community to the extent that they do not uh, appear as a threat to the local community. So with this, we were able to, my friends and I, we were able to think about empowering the Syrian refugees who are currently living in Turkey, targeting basically the women, because they're most affected, they're the most vulnerable uh, community coming in, they've left their husbands or they're, they're widowed, and they're coming into Turkey, they have, they have a business idea maybe, but they do not know how to launch it. So we were going into the community where the Syrian refugees were living and trying to find these women who are making basically handicraft, uh, just handicraft products, maybe like a band or a toy. And that um, the idea of it is uh, right now when you're buying a product, it's more about the story behind the product. Like you see like a very good shirt being sold in H&M, but the, the story behind it, it's a Bangladeshi kid who has actually been exploited to actually even make the product. 
So in Turkey right now, the reality is that there are Syrian kids who are at between the age of maybe 11, 13, 14, who are working in factories, making products. But you didn't know this story. You'd go to the store and buy a, pro uh, buy a shirt. Can we stop at this, please? Yes. You see, children right for education mm -hmm. in certain countries. But children of Turkey, or sorry, of Syria, become the breadwinner. When we be able to let them to work, support the mother or the widow, look after four or five children, or what we'll do to them. That's what yes, 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 that's exactly what I'm focusing on. So my issue is that how do we get the kids off the streets from selling tissues around Istanbul? Or how do we actually prevent them from going to looking for jobs in these factories? So we target the woman because if the woman can make a product, the only problem is she, does, she doesn't have the language, the Turkish language, to sell the product in the market. So we were going to be the mediator between the Syrian refugees and the Turkish community. So the good thing is that a group of us who are actually coming from different parts of the world, there were Arabs as well from Egypt and Tunisia, we could go into the community to build the level of trust with the women for them to tell us about the products that they're selling and we would sell it to them with the promise that we return the profit back to them so that they don't have to send the kids out in the streets begging. So that kind of conflict that I'm talking about, it's the one that's uh, coming in with the wave of refugees going into countries. And it's, it may not be something uh, happening right now in your country, but it's something that's going on around the world, especially with the crisis. So what she's saying, how to receive these foreign groups, or well, most of the time, might look down at them. Actually, then to accommodate them. By the way, so how is North conflict in Sudan, uh, and I'm looking to a million people in the It was more than one million people from the south before the independence of the south. Apart from the people who come from Central Africa, from Uganda, from the, so Sudan were hosting a few million in, in the good old days, from the east, from the west, from the west, and the south. And, uh, so they were hosting all of this. This is very serious because some of those girls being exploited in the camps, that's right, yeah. all by the local community. And this is a big issue on the security of the host country. Another country which is not uh, Turkey, the number of refugees in Lebanon is nearly third of the population. In certain cities like Arsal, it becomes 50% or 60% of the local population, which it creates an economic threat, cultural threat, and security threat. Totally. I think the first thing that the hosting community should understand is that these people were not just a refugees, just a town. It comes with a very negative connotation, but these people had lives before that. The people who are actually businessmen, they have skills and talents. So when they're coming into the new community, Yes, they, mu they might have lost everything in the country, but they're trying to rebuild their lives. So unless you help them actually, or empower them enough Can to I suggest their something? Mm -hmm. yes. With my dream, going to your dream. Yes. Can we ask UN and local government to let them to have their own local economy? Which is not happening. Yes. Yeah. Their own local economy means that actually I have doctors, I have businessmen, they come to their own local market while they are refugees, mm -hmm. to spend money on themselves. Instead of the woman sitting at home doing nothing, she can do something and sell it in the market and make the economy there. Yeah. This is not happening. Okay. And actually, the local education as well. Sometimes you force them to learn something that they don't like. That's where the conflict comes back. Okay, I'll give you another minute. I think I'm um, pretty much done. I just want us to, even though we feel distant with the crisis that's happening, you may be living in Sudan or Kenya and you feel like this issue is all the way in Syria, but personally the passion that comes with me is my mom was a refugee from Uganda to Kenya. So we've, it's, it's, a, it's a movement of people and nobody knows when this thing will pop up in your country. You know, If you're forced to move from your country, your home country, to another country, you expect to be treated in a, a human way. So all of us should open our minds into accepting the other community and understanding that uh, everybody has potential and the capacity to grow and rebuild and less on the threat they Thank pose you. in the community. Thank you, sister. What was your name? Khadija. Khadija, mother Khadija. Aizman <laughs> <laughs>
يمان الله العظيم المن دول حضربهم بالعصاية على راسه يمن لا بديهم متشانس خايفين من ايه Clapping. The first man to 
take the car. Where are you coming from? South Africa. Amanda. Amanda. Uh, my name is uh, Toha Ali from uh, South Africa, from Johannesburg. I'm a student here in the uh, International University of Africa. I'm doing mass communication. Uh, my problem or my. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, xenophobia. So how, how, many, how many countries are sending the refugees to South Africa? Uh, actually, countries don't send refugees to South Africa, but they come themselves. They come themselves. Yeah. They produce. They produce. Yeah. How many? Mm, like, Six, seven countries. Hey, I see. It like all of Africa is coming to South Africa. Okay, fine. Yeah, the problem we have in South Africa is uh, we call we had a few years back we had a xenophobia. Why was it? Is the phobia happening? People are claiming that these this people refugees are coming and taking our jobs away. But if you look at it, those people who are coming are not taking their jobs away. The problem is that the government itself is not creating jobs for the locals. So if you don't create jobs for the locals and the politicians are there to eat money, not creating jobs for the, uh, for the people. So this caused war and war and tribalism and, uh, and and race wars. So we, the politicians have to solve this. Once the politicians don't solve this, then the war will continue till, till, till the world is, is finished. Thank you. So here you talk about the government and the ability to create jobs for the local community and to spend money on the international the refugees. Unfortunately, the money I spent on the refugees is the UN money. But the local community does not understand that. They said that the people who can take the facilities, but it comes from uh, UN. The other thing is any government receiving refugees benefiting from the UN and the international community. Whether most of the money goes to the refugees or not, this is beside the point. Thank you. you. Want to say something? Okay, come on. And they need somebody else. Can keep, keep thinking about you. We talked about uh, we talked about Afghanistan. We talked about India, Kashmir. We talked about. Uh, uh, in your case, uh, Turkey, uh, Syria, problem. We talked about Azerbaijan, uh, uh, Armenia. We still need to talk about other countries in Africa. And uh, I've got a lot of European brothers here from Africa. Okay. Go on. I'll, I'll just continue the topic which Khadija has started. So, how, if the refugees are inside, I mean, they receive money either from the government or from the UN, say. How can we make them earn themselves? So what uh, we like to make it sustainable because if the fund is over, then what will you do? If the fund becomes can over, uh, usually the refugees are supported either by the government, people, or by the UN. But let's say due to whatever reason, the fund is over. So now what is next? How can we make it sustainable? So we think of sustainable solutions, okay? So for example, uh, we never give money just like that, because we want them to be independent and uh, have sustainable solutions. So one part which Khadija has said, uh, that they have not worked with refugees, but I'm just giving two things which can be uh, accompanied with the refugees, which we have been working. Uh, we work with the handicaps. You know the handicaps, they, we ask them, they are making wooden arts. So they make wooden arts, they are handicaps. They make wooden arts and we sell it for them and we get money from it. So that's the same thing which they can do it. It's very minimum, it doesn't need much budget. We just uh, start the initiative with it. The second thing, the ladies. The ladies make the tablecloths, handicrafts, and things like that, and we sell it for them. So those, that is one thing. And the second thing, sports. Of course, I am a sport lover. So how can we make sport as a sustainable solution for them? Uh, we are doing two things. We are two groups. One is a male group, and one is a female group. Our male partners, they do is, Every kilometer they cycle, they put one SDG per kilometer. So, and our, our friends, they cycle about 100 kilometers per week. Or you can say one day, 100 kilometers a day. They don't cycle every day, but they can even. So, let's say there are 20 of them, and all of them are putting in there. They gather this money, and they try to find solutions for them. Let's say they give them bikes, and they again join for the cycling, and it becomes continuous sustainability for the funding for them. The second thing we do for female, for female we put 5 SDG per kilometer. So every kilometer we cycle, we put 5 SDG, different friends, different uh, volunteers, donors, whatever, we put 5 SDG and the money we use it to solve the solutions for them. 
So we, well, the first thing we try to give them the bikes so that they cycle and it becomes increased continuous sustainability of money. So we have to find sustainable solutions. That's what my theme was. Thank you. So what she's saying, when you are new and innovative, not, not just sustainable, new innovative sustainable solution outside the boxes of you and the fund. It's one of the one of the SDG innovation. Okay. okay. New innovative sustainable solution. Okay? Thank you, sister. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yeah, else, yeah, else. Oh, it's what I said. Alhamdulillah, men is coming back. I want men in black. What was the name of the movie you star? Men in black? No, no, the star, the star. Is what the policeman and the other one who used to hit him? Go on. Hello, my name is Shamsuddin. I'm also a student. He's the son of the religion. Your name is the son of the religion. It's not S-U-N, not S-O-N. So, a student at uh, Sudan University of Science and Technology, also from Nigeria. Uh, when we're talking about peace, I want us to look into it from a diversified manner. Because like everything is going to the area of refugee. For example, we have two or three major problems in Nigeria as a country. Number one is corruption, either in the government or among the politicians. Number two is the issue of those who are trying to, uh, like secession, those who are trying to break the country into two, like my dear brother from Cameroon. And we have a problem with Niger, uh, Niger Delta, and if Niger Delta should break away from Nigeria now, a lot of refugees will be going to uh, Cameroon. And we still don't forget the case of Bakese Peninsula, which still gave uh, Cameroon to have a larger percentage of Nigerian refugees. Another thing is the issue of Boko Haram. Uh, Boko Haram is from the issue of uh, religion, now to external forces, because the current Boko Haram is no longer out of religion, but behind the corner. So uh, these are some of the major problems uh, confronting various countries. And then how do we achieve these, uh, how do we bring solutions to some of these pertinent challenges confronting um, the countries? Well, let's talk about the issue of corruption. Like in Africa, not only in Africa, in the whole world. Even corruption to Africa is a very, very strange world. Africa got the idea of corruption from the Western world. There's nothing we can do with, with the uh, UNHR regarding the refugee without element of corruption involved. There's nothing we can do about the political parties, conflict management, conflict resolution without corruption involved. And there's nothing we can do to solve the issue of succession because every day, every time, people still feel they are getting marginalized. And if you don't solve the issue of marginalization, trying to integrate tribes and trying to make sure that um, resource control as well are being looked into, then country by country will continue to break into two. We've seen the unresolved problem of Sudan and South Sudan. And then my dear sister from Kenya went on to Turkish. We've seen what's going to happen again from Mombasa and other parts of Kenya. And of course, we can see what's going on in Salaka and the other one in the Central African Republic. And like that, like that, I think we should make each of our youth contribution to peace in a more diversified way because all of us, we have that element of um, element of resistance in the world. So if we are affected by any means, how do we use our resistance force to make sure that we do not go outside the limits of peace? I think this should be another major thing that the world needs to learn. The one need to learn how to manage peace instead of going to conflict. How can we learn how to manage peace? Any answer? It's a big ask. How to do you believe in peace? First of all, do you believe in peace first? Yes. yes. Or we we'll sit down in the meeting and say, yeah, give me a hug. <laughs> Take a photo. Facebook, Facebook, this way. And you know, the, the knife has his back. This is my knife. <laughs> it's not peace, it's a stock show. Yeah. We have to believe really that we want to build, if we want to build peace, we have to give in some of our uh, issues or to drop some of our issues and to reconcile with that. This is what Nelson Mandela did. We, we have not practiced or have not seen 
what happened to the South Africa, where is the brother? Okay. Uh, uh, native population by the other people. For how many years? 100 years? 200 years? Many years. Many years. Okay. But if we are going to open the bag of war, say that you killed my mother, you killed my grandmother, he said, okay, turn over, turn over the page, turn okay, the page over. The start. Otherwise, to be an atheist. That's why South Africa started actually to come. It's not the first time. At the time of uh, uh, Islam, Prophet Sallallahu when he entered Mecca, okay, he was thrown out of Medina, from Mecca to Medina, and to Abyssinia, and which is uh, Ethiopia now, and the other tortured, the money was stolen, and so on. When he came back in the conquest, they asked him, he asked to know them, what do you think I'm going to do with you? He said, you are a good brother. Son of a good brother. He said, okay, go. You are free. Huh? Yeah, but actually there. And he said that whoever enters his house, stay in his house, is, free, is, is, is safe. And the house of God is safe. And the house of the leader of, 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 of Christ is safe. Here he identified the house of the leader of Christ who was not a Muslim. In respect to this individual. So in this case, Prophet did 1400 years before Nelson Mandela to turn the page of Allah's finished. You have to forget that, in spite of fact, I am the one who was winning the war against you, but finished and didn't actually build our community from the beginning. Thank you. My question now to all of you is religion a part of conflict or a part of peace? تعالي هنا ما تكلمتيش انت وانت شكلك كده مصري زي بس سودانيه يعني تعالى من جنب كده ان ريليشن از بارت اوف كونفليكت اور بارت اوف بيس جود افتنون فارس جوزيف اي ثينك اكوردنج تو اور ايدياز اوكي اف وي ار ليفينج اند اكسبت اذرز سو وي كان اكسبت ديفرنت ريليجن or beliefs or not, we have uh, confidence, more confidence. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Religion a part of conflict? I'll, I'll take Cameron first, because he did not speak. And you have to give some right to the men, because otherwise there will be one in that. I just want to ask the question, is part or a part? Part. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think uh, religious religion is part of this part of conflict because I, I study uh, I make some research with uh, Central African refugees in the east of Cameroon in 2014 with my organization I collaborate with the UNHCR and the conflict in South uh, in, um, in Central African Republic when you watch TV or international news. To live, you just know that it's Muslim against Christians. This is the media. Yes, that is the media. But when I get to the field, I visit two uh, refugees camps, and one was just for Muslim, and the other one just for Christian. But the data we received from them, it was no religion involved. So it was just like political instrumentalization and. This was what of the... So you could say the, the religion to be a part of solution? Yes, solution. Because I know, I, I study, I, I'm part of many networks of dispute in the world, and I know that any religions, uh, any religion, sorry, I'm not graduating in English, any religion have the basic... Uh, and, and, uh, right. Yes, they moralize people to peace and to love. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sister. My idea is not so far from me. Uh, what I think, uh, or what I'm sure about, is religious itself is calling for peace, Allah, as He mentioned. But how do we act with, with religious? What about feeling of religious? What, what about our faith in religious? This is what makes the conflict. If we did not understand religion itself in reality, we see the, the conflict. 
But religious itself, it's asking for peace and love. Okay. So you talk about the people who interpret religion. The scholars will be a part of the problem as well. Okay. Right. Anybody else? We talk about Cameroon, Sudan, Kashmir, uh, Syria, South Africa, Nigeria. Did you know what Boko Haram? Yeah. Chad. I didn't hear it. Chad. Huh? Chad. I'll get, I'll, get, I'll get him first and then I'll come to the Chad. Where you watch your name? Where are you from? Okay, my name is Ibrahim Adam Muhammad. I'm also from Nigeria. I can... Nigeria is everywhere. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I can say that the religion is the part of the conflict and also part of the peace. It depends on the shoulder of the leaders of the religions. These are the people that they will teach and interpret the correct content of the religion. So if the religious leaders continue to interpret bad side or negative context of the religion, it will lead to eternal conflict. And when if the religious leader interpret the correct content of the religion, it will lead to peace. That's all. So that means that we have to build the bridges between all religions. If we look at our religions with S, we find that in, on the basis of faith, which is Aqidah, this fundamental issue which is untouchable. That's right. But there's some commonly shared values, which is more than 80 to 90 percent between one another. Okay? Why don't we leave the Aqidah, the faith part, which is personal to ourselves, and share the values which is common amongst us? This number. Let us agree on a certain common shared values. Then once we work together as Muslim, Christian, Jews, Buddhist, Hindu, everybody, we might develop a newly developed moral value based on our relationship together. We are talking, we are not talking about aqidah or faith. If you believe, if you believe in Trinity, and the people monastery, this is actually fundamental for me. But I'll talk about the community commonly shared value, which is Islam, Christianity, the teaching of Jesus, the spirit of the name of Moses, Muhammad, of Buddha, of the, what's it, Buddha and, and so on and so on. Because they have, they have commonly shared values for Islam, with Islam, with Christianity, and with others. So once we look at the positive and or the commonality, we will not look at the negative and the differences. And we respect the private aqidah part of each religion. Okay, camera, uh, chat. The Kalim Urdu. I will use a translator. You can speak Sherman. Watch, watch. Is the new language called Sherman? Dutch. Francois. Francois. Okay, me and Arab. السلام <laughs> 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 Muslims. 
So establish program uh, every year, one day, like a hit or like celebration day, and all religions come together and pray and make religion something. Peace day, it's called peace day. To dialogue between religions. Christian against Muslim or Shia against Sunni 
In Iraq, Shia and Sunni were living, nobody knew who was the next neighbor, door neighbor. But now, it becomes a public scene, you see? Even in Egypt, even, we did not know that we have Shia in Egypt. Okay? Our Christian neighbors, we did not know them, whether they are Catholic or Orthodox or Anglican or whatever it is. It's, they are our neighbors. That's it. But nowadays, politicizing religion makes it very dangerous. Politicizing religion, whether it comes from a politician or it comes from the clergy themselves, becomes very dangerous. Okay, somebody wants to speak? Anybody else? Yes, brother? And I want some, somebody from Asia. I'm not going to leave you go home. Okay. And I, let me take The men are very shy tonight. And they'll get you, Mr. Indonesia. Okay. And no, no other misters. Okay. In the Sudan, you Inshallah. Aki. One is there. She did it. Давайте я буду начинать разговаривать на русский, потому что был конфликт, который был с Сирией и Азербайджаном. Если сестры Минска, которые из Азербайджана, знают это, это будет очень хорошо. Экономические реформы – это решить все. Если сделаем, если сделаем это, тогда урегулировать эту проблему. Сейчас мы не э, начинаем. Это на русском. Это на Главное, что я вас поняла.
uh, the power of social media technology. Uh, you see, most of our youth, they spend a lot of time using technology. And as a teacher, I don't consider that as a threat. In fact, we could use social media to inculcate or to, uh, to make our students get involved in what's happening, like in promotion of peace, understanding other culture. Uh, we have to maximize the potential of social media technology. No. Is the social media is a part of the problem or solution? I believe that it should be a solution. But people are throwing a lot of uh, lies. Yes, fake news, rumors, uh, lies. I think that to sift, we have to screen the information coming in, and that's where the help of education will come in. Uh, we should tell the students or the youth not to believe everything that social media is feeding them. We have to be uh, also critical of what is being read newspaper, in uh, what we watch in television. Not everything is real, and we have to think critically and we have to criticize also. Thank you. So he's talking about the foreign interest in the local resources, whether in Philippines or Afghanistan or any part of the world without actually mentioning, because we don't want to politicize, because we are not politicians. Right? So this foreign interest is, is, is another element. Could be one of the elements in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, one of the elements in Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia conflict, and in Yemen conflict, and, and in South Sudan conflict, and so on. Okay? So don't underestimate how foreign powers are very interested in your local resources. Know your country, know your resources, protect it. One of the most important things to help any local government is to bring and build, decide it, very strong local, uh, civil, uh, local civil society sector. And this is one of the recommendations of the World Economic Summit last year, is localism or localization. We actually have got strong civil society sector, thousands of organizations responding to the social needs. Local. We can create local leadership. We can sometimes, and quite often, the local organization reaches the conflict zone or the problem area before any government office. That does not mean that we have to neglect the government or no, but we have to report to the government before the problem is created. Okay? Fourth, right? To empower the grassroots. To empower, definitely, empower the citizen. Any country is about the citizen. Any state is about the citizen. Any society is about the citizen. Huh? Any community is about the citizen. Himself or herself. Or herself or himself. There's no difference between himself or herself because this is their own right. Huh? On the government. So the government is there because of the citizen. Elected the government. Thank you. Any other comment? Thank you, brother. What's your name? Please say your name. I'm Bobby. Bobby. Why are you? Oh. Hold it. Say it My name is... Break the wall. Say what? Huh? <laughs> My name is Bobby. Bobby. Yeah. Okay. So say it. Bobby Ray. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Hello, yeah. Shabab. Shabab. Tayyip. Enter the name until Allah is You are going to... <laughs> <laughs> time, uh, she's very active on you after her, and now what time is it now? Because you have to wrap up the thing before half past four. Do you believe in Bollywood? Yes. Bollywood? Thank you. You, you know what Bollywood? Yes, yes of yes. course. <laughs> <laughs> this is not working, huh? Do you know any Bollywood? Oh, that's it. Uh, well, there's Bollywood, and there's Bollywood. Where's Bollywood? Well, Hollywood is something, yeah. Hollywood is. No, but there's another Hollywood. <laughs> and Lahore. And there's Hollywood, which is Cairo. And there's. Uh, Hollywood. Hollywood, another Hollywood in Dubai. Oh. Two Hollywood. Ah, good time. Good time. Okay. Maybe 
maybe today you are going to get bored with my talks. But we are going to get bored with my talks. Yes, it's a new innovation. Okay, I'll talk about two points. Uh, religion and the social media. Actually not social media, but how to approach the community. So we are talking about religion. Is religion, uh, yeah, does religion mean peace or conflict? Every religion means peace, okay? But how can religion become a reason of conflict? There are three important things. One is beliefs, one is taboos, and one is personal benefits. Um, I'll tell you in the few... Uh, and you say them, belief, taboo? Personal beliefs, taboos, uh, and personal benefits. Uh, 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 Belief, taboos, and benefits. Okay. Okay. So, how can it become like that? So, we have been working in a community of uh, sickle cell disease in uh, Kurdufan, that is Western Sudan. Uh, I'm an Indian, okay, and I'm a foreigner. How would I approach the community? They will not trust me, they will not believe me. You cannot go direct to the community, any community, any local population, you cannot go directly without approaching to their leaders and their sheikhs. Uh, those are the two main gateway, the leaders and the sheikhs. Because if you don't have their support, you cannot enter the community. So the first thing, wherever you go, you have to touch, target those two people. And don't go with your foreign people, go with the locals. Go with the locals. If, the, if uh, let's say, if I'm, I'm going from Khartoum, I should not go for people from the Khartoum. I should find people from the current city or from the tribes itself. I work with shepherds. So I have found people working with the shepherds themselves and I have entered their community. So you have to go with the locals who are working in that region. This is one issue. And the second issue was... Um, Taboo. Taboo. Okay. Taboo and personal benefit, I'll tell you. So what is sickle cell disease? It's a genetic disease which, uh, which comes by marrying their cousins. Okay, and like I would say that, uh, in, okay, I'm not against any religion, okay, but in, in religion, for example, most of Sudanese, uh, they believe that if you have a cousin who is uh, ready to marry you, you would go for the cousin rather than going for someone from far. So that is what the religion says. But, okay, then I mean, I know. The culture says. The culture says that, okay. Okay, so what do they do? Uh, what do they do? Because their personal benefit is the wealth, the animal wealth. The land. The land and the animal wealth. To preserve the land and the animal wealth, they give it the name of the religion and they marry their cousins. So it's their personal benefit. The second thing, taboos. They say that uh, the taboos, how can uh, taboos become an issue of religious conflict? So the other thing they say that, uh, for example, if these women, has uh, this thing, uh, okay, let's say if she has the disease and if you go after her, you will catch the disease. And they separate, they discriminate the women. They discriminate the women that she is not good. They do not say witch or demon, but they will just separate and discriminate her. Isolate her. Isolate her. So they just do it as a person benefits and terms. Part of the culture. Part of the culture. Because that's actually, even in, in India, you remember when somebody is come with them, the good old days, what they do to Oh, her. no. If somebody becomes widow, they isolate her completely. She has to live alone. And uh, sometimes, sometimes in past, they used to ask her that, uh, you know, we cremate, we don't bury, we cremate. She has to cremate herself. She has to kill herself if her husband has passed away. Thank you. Pleasure. Cameron. Oh, where are you from? Cameron, come to Ata. The last two, inshallah. What time is it now? Four and ten. Huh? Four and ten. Four? On the team. Quickly. Yes. Uh, I want one just one minute. Okay. I want just to mention one, two aspects that can also cause conflict: the governance and language barrier. Governance and language barrier. Governance. Because in Cameroon, for example, we are a bilingual country, but we have ten children, yeah. and just two are. Uh, mainly Anglophone region, near to Nigeria. And recently, there is like kind of recession in that those regions, they want to be free because they think they are marginalized because of their language. But like my tribe, I'm more, but more people are from Francophone zone and from Anglophone zone. Ah, to impose. Yes, so people are thinking, if I have to separate with my family because just because he's uh, Anglophone, so one of, this is one of the, 
the aspect you have to, to mention about. And also government, because government and the government officials have to consider every community as part of the state. Because in Cameroon, uh, some regions are kind of marginalized, oh, and uh, especially in the extreme, in the far north of uh, Cameroon, there you cannot find like infrastructure, it's difficult oh, to have like, school. Neglect yes. minority. Yeah, neglect minority. Okay. Let me add one. All right, because just we need to finish. Yeah, just mm -hmm. As he said, uh, <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ahmed, I'm from Nigeria. We, the Africans, to be sincere, most of our leaders, they betray us. If you are son of nobody in Africa, then you are nobody. The government cycling within themselves. If you wake up, let's assume now, all of us here, we are graduates. We are not working. We are youths. Me and you, we are working with the government. If I'm going to step down, I will take my son to be the next president. I will call on that one. And he's better than him than probation by everything, by qualification, by his experience. This is the only problem of the government's corruption. Yeah, the corruption. Thank you. The corruption has become our, already in our blood with the Africans. When we keep on trying to say we are copying Americans, we're copying, we're copying. But no, we are not copying, we're betraying ourselves. Except we can remove this heartless and respect for one another within the religion. If I can respect your religion, you can accept mine. I think we can work together. And without two heads are better than one. If we join our hand together, we can achieve our goal. Without achieving that goal, without joining our hand, we will never achieve any goal in any society. Thank you. Thank you, boss. Last comment from Sudan. And you have to read some of these recommendations. And if you have got some important points, Sister uh, Khadija, let us know about it. Make it easy and soft and short. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحمد شوقي أنا البشير من السودان أنا بفتكر إنه ما في دين من الديانات بيدعو إلى الحرب كل الأديان بتدعو إلى السلام All religions are calling for peace نعم لكن المشكلة في الفهم الخاطئ للأديان والمعتقدات The problem is in the wrong understanding of religion نعم هذا ما يدفع الناس إلى الحروب والتقاتل مع بعض. And this leads to conflict. وهنا يأتي دور رجال الدين بأن يقوموا بحملات توعية كبيرة جدا خاصة وسط الشباب بإزالة هذه المفاهيم الخاطئة. And we need to get those religious leaders to make public aware of on the youth of the right procedures of living together. نعم. وأنا مفتكر إنه أيضا من إحدى مشاكل التطرف عند الشباب والناس عموما إنه الكبت الواحد لم يكون مضبوط ولم يكون نعم لديه إحساس بالظلم نعم مثلا من المشاكل التي يعاني منها الشباب البطالة والمشاكل الكثيرة المتعلقة بالدولة نعم وأيضا هنالك مشكلة أريد أن أشير إليها تحدث في خاصة في غرب السودان وهي المشاكل بين الرعاة والمزارعين نعم وذلك بانه الرعاة يدخلون الماشيه الى المزارع حتى ترعى فيها وهنا يحدث الخلاف because of the animals go to eat the crops and eat the vegetation and this is what conflict happens نعم وهنا ياتي دور الحكومه بان تحل هذا النزاع And this is the role of the government, actually, or even the local community to sort out this problem. Well, I'm taking it to... Yes, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if all the people are the people who 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 are the people
that doesn't mean if the, if, uh, the, the, if the, the people are harmonious, there's no conflict. That's what they say. Yes. Sections 
for the youth to sit together and discuss their issues. And she mentioned a nice example. She went to Azerbaijan and she lived for six days with a family. Hungry. Hungry, hungry. Yeah. With a family. And she sit with the family and they are welcoming with her when she returned back home. She talked her she talked to her family and relative about her experiment and her passion about it. So they are they start welcoming about the idea. about creation job that can solve the problem. And another thing, uh, what was so important, is talking about uh, sustainability and innovation for the solution that we, we used or we mentioned. And uh, the Nigerian problem, three problems, corruption and uh, uh, Boko Haram. And there is another one I did not, I cannot read it. Uh, another one, uh, how, how leaders can affect in solving the problems. Uh, the, lack, the lack of resources and uh, how can we solve the identity problems. Um, at the end, all religious is calling for peace. Thank you. So if you can call, give all your uh, notes to Hassan, please, to collect everything, inshallah. To conclude, no one can live alone and isolated in the world nowadays. The world with the revolution of the uh, information technology becomes like a small room, <coughs> not even a village. It's even the economy is affected, culture is affected, language is affected, history is affected, composition of the community is affected. So we have to understand how can we live together. That we have, we must. It's number one. Number two, for any community leader or any leader who is leading a country, a community, a society, by all the moral aspects, he or she have to understand the composition of the community. When you talk about minorities, different cultures, different religions, different values, cannot claim that you are a community leader if you do not comprehend what the community, your community is about. Even if you are from the majority community. Even majority community now cannot rule. Because most of the problems come from the deprived, minority, marginalized communities. This is number two. Number three, the role of civil society in protecting the country, protecting the state, protecting the nation, protecting the society. Because they can outreach most of the problem before it becomes a magnanimous problem and report to the government and be a partner with the government. This is number three. Number four, we are very weak in research and advocacy. We have to invest. Because all our talks are based on emotion. He said, she said, we said, we, without having documentation, proper documentation, nobody will listen to us. No government, no institution, nothing. Number four, education. Education, education. I keep saying education till you go home, each one of you. Because the ignorant nation is easily led by crooks who can take them, swing them, like bend them, riot them, send them. So education is very, 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 very important for all of us. Number five or six, how can we fight Corruption, extremism, radicalism, and terrorism by empowering the local community. They can defend the country from within and from outside as well. Empowering the local community, the local citizens, 
the local civil society organization will be able to tackle extremism, radicalism, terrorism, and corruption. Nowadays, in your country, you see what the judiciary did to the prime minister of his country. Okay? It doesn't happen in most of the African countries and other countries. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. He is resigned yesterday. There's a, there's a court case against him. The independence of the state or institution from the state itself. No, no, from, from the government. The independence of the state institution from the government. Because they have to keep an arm lens between the state institution and the government. So, what else? I think that the conflict. Armed conflicts, sooner or later, has to become a political solution. That's what we have seen in the Second World War after killing 60 million people between Russia and Europe and other places, North Africa and, 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 they sat down. And they created the European Union. That's right. The warring faction became a founding member of economic society. They found one niche, economy. Let's talk about the economy, how to build our, the economy of Europe. And they agreed on one point. So when you have a long list in negotiation, start with one or two, or two points to agree on and bend on it. Bend on the success story of having the first success story in building your country. You might have a list of 20 points, but you can't do the 20 points. All of them are valid. But let's agree between you and me as Sudanese and from the south. You are from the south or from the north? Okay? Agree on one point or two points and work on it. If we succeed, we can go to the most difficult one. Don't ever start with a difficult point in negotiation. Slowly, 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 then people build the trust. With in negotiation, you have to build the trust and the confidence in the heart of your uh, counterpart. Okay? And do not exclude civil society from the negotiating table. This was happening now with the Syrian. First time we discussed in Europe, uh, 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 15, 14 years ago, I was in a meeting with a big organization called, I think, Voice of Concord, and next to me was somebody from the NATO, an officer, a military officer. And I mentioned at that time, we need to involve the humanitarian organization in the, in the negotiating dialogue. Okay? This is me. I know. Okay? He said, what? The military officer. I said, yes, because we know more than you. As a minister or a prime minister, you came to the field yesterday or six months ago, but this organization there for the last 20 years. Now they are involved in the Syrian civil society organization to attend the negotiating uh, uh, table in Geneva. Okay? So I thank you, all of you very much, for that fruitful, diverse discussion. And the first step is to shake hands. Before shaking hands, perception. If you look at me and you don't like me, you will never shake hands with me. That's right? So when you look at the mirror, look at how the people look at you, not how you look at yourself in the mirror. But how, what you, how, what, how can you see yourself? But how the people will see you. When you listen to your voice, see how the people listening to it, understanding it, before you yourself like it. It's a problem between people looking at you differently. You say, yeah, I've, not, I've done nothing wrong. But people don't understand you. People look at you and they're scared, whether you're a male or female. Thank you very much, and it's time for a break. There's no need for clapping, you can give me five pounds. <laughs> time for a break. Five Sudanese pounds.
I think there's a break outside from half past four to five. Post. Okay. 